The Working Artist Project is brought to you by Second Line Arts Collective. Learn how you can support at secondlinearts.org. We're creating a platform for those who are curious. One that tells the story from the artist's perspective. Moments in time, captured from the innovators who are reshaping dance, music, theater, and the visual arts. This is The Working Artist Project. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My name is Darian Douglas, and we are excited to be back in the house. Gregory Aji, what's good? I stole your line, baby. It's all good, man. I was like, my my mouse disconnected, and I was like, oh my god, am I gonna be able to switch over an OBS real quick? <laughs> See, these are the things you think about when you're running a podcast. <laughs> okay. uh, we've been we've been uh, missing in action here for a couple of weeks, but but we're happy to be back, and we got a real special guest for y'all. Uh, we've been working hard all day because we've been where we're here in New Orleans, right, Greg? Doing what? This is our sixth annual Sanaa Music Workshop, and uh, today was our first day of camp. And man, it was it was truly uh, a beautiful thing to to watch a full year of hard work come to uh, come to reality. And we have uh, thirty very talented and uh, hardworking, driven young musicians that are partaking in the camp this year. And uh, man, it was it was just a, a very beautiful experience to get everyone together. And uh, hear them listen, hear them start to work on some of the music. And uh, we had a great masterclass by the fantastic Roderick Pollen this afternoon. And you remember what, any of his quotes? Uh, the hustle don't stop, baby. The hustle, hustle don't stop. stop. <laughs> well, check. If you don't practice, you're going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yo, man. So y'all y'all go, uh, you can check a lot of this stuff out on our YouTube and in social media but anyway let's get right to the show today we got one of the baddest of the bad uh i've admired this cat for for many many years he's uh, a, a true genius on the drums he's played with all kind of people delphio marcellus jason marcellus uh ellis marcellus jermaine basil gregory ig jason weaver steven lance i can go on and on on and on and on he plays i'm pretty sure he plays in the no no joe big band right and uh man wow he's just an amazing drummer and i'm excited today to 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 pick his brain about music and life and also hopefully we're gonna get into some of his brand new music so without further ado why don't we welcome the countryest of country gerald Watkins jr to the working artist project <laughs> <laughs> what's going on y'all hey man i don't know if you know this greg but uh hold on hold on huh and and you from mississippi originally right <laughs> that, that, well, that, that may be alabama and mississippi gotta be the two country states in the union so i don't hey, know hey, you know what's number three i don't know if you can call country, man. <laughs> hey, hey man Look, I thought Virginia was the north until I went there, and I said, "God damn, boy, these don't." <laughs> Virginia like is the north of the south. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> I think I'm going to take this opportunity just to sit back, relax, and watch two <laughs> country ass motherfucker drummers go at it today. <laughs> Dude, hey, you from Louisiana too, Greg? You can't call nobody country, man. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look, I'm I'm from Kenner, Louisiana, so. <laughs> I, I embraced my, the redneck within me. <laughs> Sophistication is strong within us tonight, baby. Yeah, it is. It's a pleasure to be up here with you guys, man. Oh, thank you, bro. <laughs> Listen, man, let's, I, I want to get into, because, you know, Gerald, I really don't even know your story, man. I want you to tell me, because we kind of, we kind of was passing. Yeah, I was coming in, you was coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So I want to I want to dive into that man and, and hear how you got into music and how you made it. To okay. The yeah. Well, for me, it's genetically. Um, both of my parents are musicians. Um, my father and my mother both played the organ, um, and in the church. Um, my grandfather um, was a pastor, um, and my grandmother was the organist for my grandfather's church. My grandfather, I mean, my grandmother and my grandfather passed it down to my dad. And my dad passed it down to me. Um, my dad met my mom um, 
because my mom was taking lessons from my grandmother and they met um and my dad met my mom because my grandmother was teaching my mom she taught in piano um, for many years in Chicago so music kind of runs deep in the family so they thought I was going to be another um, organist but uh, they sat me on some drums one day after church and um, the rest was history you know I kind of took you know to the drums pretty naturally uh, more so than I did the piano so uh, for me my, my first upbringing is playing in church you know behind the choirs and behind the different preachers um, and I didn't get any formal training until I got to middle school and joined the band. And then I got to high school and then I just became a real marching band, like head. I was a man, I was a marching band, head, everything was. And then the movie Drumline came out <laughs> the, my freshman year of high school. So, um, you know, everything for me was marching band. And then I went to college um, at Norfolk State University who has a great um, marching band program and a great drum line. Um, and so I, I didn't think about anything jazz related until I got to college. Um, so first was gospel, um, second was marching band. Um, and then when I got to college at Norfolk State, that's when I was introduced to, you know, playing different types of music, R&B, um, hip hop, uh, uh, jazz. Um, and then from there, um, I played in amusement parks in Virginia, Williamsburg, Virginia. I played at Bush Gardens for a few years, but then, then I got tired of the monotony of playing the same show every day. Um, so then I went back to school. Um, I had auditioned to go to, uh, Manhattan School of Music, um, didn't get in and rightly so, cause I wasn't ready for that type of art. Um, but um, my stage manager who worked with me at Bush Gardens, she had went to Florida State and she's like, hey, Florida State has a great marching, I mean, I'm a great marching band, great jazz program there. And she uh, um, encouraged me to audition there. And then that's when I met um, Leon Anderson. Um, he invited me to audition. And the day we met, you know, I knew he was a guy I needed to learn from. Um, and so in my two years at Florida State, you know, that was my introduction to really like formally learning jazz. Um, and that was in 20, that was in 2013. Um, and so I'm still learning, you know, so I spent two years there. Um, lived in Florida for another year after I graduated and then moved to New Orleans in 2016. Um, and, you know, since then, I mean, I just been, you know, um, learning from, you know, the cats and, and, and trying to pick up as much knowledge as I can get, man. I still feel like I got, you know, a lot more to learn, you know, and, and you know, I feel like I still feel like I'm brand new to this thing, you know? Or I think, I think all of us kind of feel like that. We're all humbled on a daily basis, man. Um, who you telling man? All the, all the time, man. Like, seriously. That's a good know, thing. I think when you're not humbled, that might mean you're not. Yeah, no Cause you problem. never get it, man. You never get it. You know, um, you know, but I, I used to feel intimidated because, you know, it was a it was cats who've been doing, you know, playing jazz since middle school, you know, you know, like you you guys are running a camp now, you know, and you got kids that are as young as what's the your what's your lowest age? Thirteen, right? We got yeah. 13. At at thirteen, I had I I ain't know nothing about jazz. All I knew was Hezekiah Walker, John P. Key. Kurt Franklin, Fred Hammond. I, I, I grew up in a, uh, my mom, my mom and dad are both ministers. So it was nothing but gospel in the house. So I grew up, you know, not knowing anything about jazz. So I was real green, you know, coming into school and, you know, and cats was showing me records and all these people who I didn't know about and all these um, famous recordings that, you know, most of the cats knew. And I'm sitting looking around like, I don't know that, you know? So uh, it's, 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 it was pretty new to me, you know, um, and, and some that aspects helps, are still that, new to me. That brings up like an interesting point, though, because, you know, I think there are a lot of cats who have gone through the jazz education cycle, you mm -hmm. know, they, they, you know, they start doing the middle school jazz band programs, they do the high school jazz band programs, they do the college program, and they can't swing, they, <laughs> they can't swing anything like you can. And so... Uh, 
I, I'll tell you. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. And finish the question, and I'll, I'll give you my theory on that. So yeah, what's the theory on that? Because again, it's just like I, I, as I'm hearing the story, I'm like, well, shit, that doesn't matter because you came out great. <laughs> <laughs> my my theory is, and this is this is this is I, I firmly believe this, and I posted this on Facebook maybe two two years ago, and it was real controversial. But I I said the African American church is the best school of music any musician can attend. Um. And I say that because in the church, um, you have to really, there's a couple, there's a couple things in church that separate um, learning music in the church from learning music in academia. Um, first, for me, and, I, and I'll speak from my personal experience, I had to watch for many years. I was the youngest, we had about, you know, in a Pentecostal church and, you know, most drummers who come up in the church, you know, there's like four or five drummers, you know, at the church, all the kids want to play drums. I was the youngest of them all. So I had to watch. And then one kid would get older and start playing gigs and leave. And then another kid would get older and start playing gigs and leave. So before I played, I red shirted, you know, for like six years of just on the front pew with my love, I would break a, I would break a fan or use some pencils and I'm beating on my lap. You know, so I watched for many years. Second, you have to use your ears. You have to, there, there's, there's no, there's no shoot, there's no sheet music. You know, you, it, it, it is, it is, it is strictly uh, trial by fire. You know, no, no music. You have to really rely on your instincts and your ears. Um, third, thirdly, um, you, you, you gotta really have mental fortitude. Because in the black church, uh, especially the elders, they're particular about how the music should sound and more importantly, how the music should feel. And a lot of times they can't tell you what it is you need to fix. They just tell you to fix it. So that means you have to investigate, you have to discover, all right, what, what is it that I'm doing wrong? What, is it, what, is it, what does it mean um, um, to, uh, you know, when someone, when, when someone says pick, pick it up, what does it mean to pick it up without rushing or, well, how, how do I, how do I navigate playing with a choir or, or playing behind a preacher or anything like that? And a lot of times they don't, they can't speak to you in musical terms. You just kind of got to figure it out. And the fourth thing is we understand the spirit of the music. You know, and, and, and that's where I feel like jazz and gospel music run parallel, the spirit of the music, you know, being able, being able to, when you hear a certain chord or when you hear a certain thing, it's like, okay, I want to do this thing, but the spirit of the music is telling me this, you know, and, and, and there's a certain feeling that you get, you know, when, when, when a piano strikes a certain sound or when a when the saxophone strikes a certain sound or the bass is like, oh, I gotta go with this because my instincts are telling me we need to go here. So those things lead me to believe that uh, uh, the gospel, uh, the, the African-American church is the best school of music that anyone can ever attend. And I, I stand by that, I stand oh, by that. Me too. And as a person who, my first gig was at church. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and you waited. I waited. You waited, man. <laughs> I waited. And then one day I got the church with nobody on the drum. Uh-huh. Yep, and you get I, lucky. It's like, oh, nobody here? All right, I'm playing today. <laughs> right? I asked my grandma, I say, you think I can play? She said, go up there and ask him. Uh-huh. So that teaches you a lot of stuff. So you got to take some, you got to take some initiative. Mm-hmm. And then you got to be ready for the truth. Yes. And the problem with academia is uh-huh. there is no room for truth. Man. <laughs> Believe Academia me. Mm-hmm. Is celebrated mediocrity. Yep, they because in the in. church, that them ladies gonna tell you, um, that won't that won't it, baby. Uh, I don't know what you're doing, but that ain't it. <laughs> ain't it. God bless you. God bless. But that I, I'm, I'm gonna lead you, man. I got kicked off the drums over the mic on, in church before. What? You know, being being a, and you get those embarrassing moments that really, <laughs> in the middle of the service. Yeah, yeah. in the middle. <laughs> In the middle of the service, on the microphone. No, in the middle of a song. Move. Get off the drum. Get off. (laughs) 
not this one. Stop playing. Right. Get get Lay off. We're going we to sing with no drums. We're going to stomp our feet and clap our hands. Get off the drums. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. one of those things too, where like, yeah, it's, you get thrown off, and you're like, "Well, someone else do it," and then just anyone from the the pews walks up and just shows you how it, to do it. <laughs> Man, Joe, it's- Joe, I I I got I want to ask you something. Go ahead. Like, I got this theory about jazz that I'm developing, mm-hmm. and and my th- new theory is this: Black people hate jazz because it is no longer a part of African American culture. Mm. Mm. I'm gonna say it. Black people hate jazz mm-hmm. because think about it. Like it has nothing to do with current African American culture, even though it, it was born out of mm-hmm. African American culture. But it's mm-hmm. been so culturally whitewashed yeah. that when they hear it, they just like, "What the fuck is this?" I I I definitely agree with you. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say that black. I don't say that black people hate jazz. I say that they don't understand jazz. Um, Because you're right. Um, You're right. Jazz has been gentrified in a way um, to where now they're they're more non-African Americans playing jazz than there are African Americans. Um, and it, and, it, and it's the music of our ancestors and it's the music of our culture. And I believe that nobody can speak our language better than we can. I think the disconnect is we stop teaching our culture how to speak our language. You know, so now, now it's at the point where African-Americans they don't they don't understand what's what's happening anymore um so i don't think they hate it i don't think black people hate jazz i think it's i think it's misunderstood you know i think the language has been lost you know just like there's a dis, just like there's a disconnect between african americans and true africans that live in africa i think there's a disconnect between musicians who understand the jazz language and those who don't that's an interesting point that's it that's an interesting point you know because africans and african-americans that's two different two different things not the same it's so not the same you know if we were to go to africa right now that's a whole nother culture that we we don't know about yep you know and if an african was to come to america that's a whole nother culture that they don't know about where I was in Africa. That's how I feel about the jazz language. I went to Africa. Everyone in Africa was trying to tell me I was from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I'm in South Africa. They're like, oh, you must be from North Africa. Mm-hmm. I'm over here. You must be from, because you ain't like us. We just, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, what are, exactly. what are you? <laughs> and talking about, like, oh, you American. Okay. Uh-huh. And then they're like, oh, okay. That explains a lot. You know? <laughs> right. You're not, you're not, yeah. It's it's interesting, man. To, that, that's an interesting experience, but that's something totally right. different i i was i'm just sitting here thinking like can you imagine greg going to an indian wedding in india and out comes a white band playing indian music i saw that happen down on uh royal street last week <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point okay so gerald dig this me and greg was down in a quarter and we heard a brass band and we was like that something it's not quite right with this Mm-hmm. culturally we didn't mm-hmm. see them and mm-hmm. when they turned the corner i was like greg what's happening because when i lived here 10 years ago mm-hmm. this didn't exist mm-hmm. it, it sounded like, it, it sounded like the star wars band meets eastern european funk rock uh-huh. and with people mm-hmm. not being any not being able to play their instruments on top of it <laughs> yeah the, I, I i had a similar a similar experience i was in phoenix uh, maybe three weeks ago, and I was at an event where I played. You know, um, I was playing with the main group, and then afterward, they had a brass band. You know, and it was, you know, a whole bunch of a, a, a whole a whole bunch of white cats and, and some other, you know, 
trying to play traditional New Orleans, I guess because they knew we were from New Orleans and they tried to, I don't know, like, hey, and like, I guess prove that they were hip to the culture. And like you, you play it to a whole bunch of New Orleans musicians, you know, cats that really don't understand the culture or, or not New Orleans, like cats that, that live in New Orleans, you know, so I'm like, you know, I, I think, I think jazz and academia um, has become the cool thing, you know, um, to, to, to study, you know, even because even when I, I talk to young cats who are in school for jazz, but they don't come out to any gigs or they don't come out um, to sit in or anything. And they, they just they just practice in their practice room and then play with school on um, combos and stuff like that. And then they have these degrees. Um, and then they go right back to school and teach. <laughs> Bruh, like, <laughs> yes. And they go, they go right back to school and teach cats uh, how to, stuff how to be, that they how don't to, know how to do how themselves. To be, exactly, how to beat jazz musicians, right? That's yeah. that's kind of crazy, right? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, we we had a good conversation about that uh, with some friends when, when Gen Conference was here in New Orleans, maybe maybe two or three years ago. We we, we had a good discussion about that. Yeah, that was the January right before COVID hit. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yep. So, Gerald, your development as a musician was fast tracked because of your your background in the gospel tradition. So, mm -hmm. when you got the jazz, you didn't have it was a lot of stuff that you you already knew. Mm -hmm. You just basically had to just to transfer the right. knowledge exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I do want everybody to hear you right now as mm -hmm. we. And, and so, I'm going to play this one. It's called okay. New, York, New York Streets. Okay, let's dig it. give them too much man they need to get out okay here. okay <laughs> they got to get out here and buy this one man yeah man check that one out man yes sir yeah. which which record is that from all right that's a debut uh record from a, a, a new group that um that i have a, a, a privilege of being a part of it's called saturn quartet um and that's uh myself on drums robin sherman on bass um ricardo pascal on um saxophones and brendan polk who actually lives in new york you know brendan uh i don't i don't know brendan man okay he actually lives in new york but he went to school with us uh at um florida state we uh we came together to record that project last year and we just released it um this year in march um and we were able to play a few shows here in town at snug and at the jazz museum um, and then last week we recorded our debut, I mean, our um, sophomore uh, record that'll be coming out um, next year. And then we got a lot of dates for the fall um, and for 2023 that we're excited about. So it's a new project, man, new band that I'm really excited about being a part of, man. I really learned a lot from those cats. Well, look, man, when, when uh, if you fall over and break your leg after I push you down... <laughs> Let me play the gigs. <laughs> man, I, I, I'm wondering as I hear that because because I'm a big admirer of all the cats who who live in New Orleans from FSU, and so after all the the shit we've been talking about academia, um, I've like you know again every time I know a cat from FSU is moving to town, I know they're gonna be killing. Uh -huh. so how how do you explain that? Like how does how do you have this anomaly? 
of uh, an institution that is turning out cats who play very soulfully and do, you know maybe don't embody the, all the shit we were just talking because florida state did it the right way um there florida state is one in my opinion it's one of the ham, handful of programs where the cats who are teaching have been on the road and, 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 and have experienced the things that they're teaching us to do. Um, the program at Florida State is led by drummer Leon Anderson. Um, and so before Leon Anderson was the um, director of jazz studies at um, Florida State, you know, he played and toured with Ellis Marsalis for many years. Um, and he taught at UNO. Um, and somewhere else here in Louisiana. And um, Ellis Marsalis is the one who encouraged him to take the job at Florida State. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the directors um, from Florida State were here in New Orleans for a conference, a music conference, and they came to Snug Harbor and they heard Leon Anderson play. Um, and then, you know, conversations led one to another. And then, you know, Ellis is the one who um, this is how Leon told me, and this is what Ellis told me too. He's like, I, you know, I, I encourage Leon to take that job at Florida State. He had a family, and um, I knew, you know, Ellis knew that he could, you know, teach the cats the right way. So, you know, you have Leon Anderson on drums who leads the program. Then you have Rodney Jordan um, on bass who still plays with and tours with Marcus Roberts. Um, you have the great Bill Peterson um, still teaching piano there. Um, Marcus Roberts still teaches there too. Um, uh, some of the professors have changed. Oh, Scotty Barnhart, um, who leads the Count Basie Orchestra, teaches trumpet at Florida State. Um, the saxophone instructor is different from when I was there. When I was there, it was Bill Kennedy. Um, now it's, I think it's um, Detweiler, but I forgot his first name. Um, same thing with trombone. It was different with Paul McKee. Then it was Nick Fence and now it's somebody else. But I say all that to say the cats that are um, there have been on the road. That's the first thing. Second is how they teach us. You're not separated by grade level. You're separated by talent level. So no, in, in most in most places, you know, the seniors are in the top band. You just matriculate through the program and they put the seniors in the top band. You might be sad, but you've been here four years, so they put the seniors in the top band. No, at Florida State, whether you're a freshman or a grad student, how well you play is the band you're in. So we all have to audition. And it's a competitive environment. You know, because you don't want to be, you don't want to be that, you know, upperclassmen playing with a bunch of freshmen, you know, or you can be a cat where, you know, I've seen where it's been freshmen in the top band, you know, because they were just that good. So um, thirdly, they keep it real with you. Like they don't sugarcoat nothing, man. We, <laughs> man, a lot of times they have us stressed out, you know. Um, cause Leon from Shreveport, you know, so he'll, he'll hit you with the, you know, say, bro, um, I don't know what you, what that is, what you was doing, man, but you, you need to revisit that, this record, or you need to check this out. Same thing with Rodney Jordan. So they kind of kept it real. They know how to talk to us, um, the way we would get talked to in the real world, you know, and they know how to diagnose, um, the problems that they heard. Like when Leon first heard me, he knew I was coming straight out of church. Our very first lesson, he was like, man, you play so loud, man. He was like, I like what you're doing. But he was like, you play, you just like, you play so loud. We got to work on your sound. We got to work on your touch. You know, we got to work on your finesse. You got to learn how to feather that bass drum. <laughs> you know, and I didn't know how to do any of that. So, um, Florida State is kind of a rare, it's a rare academic institution where you kind of get real world um, knowledge in an academic setting.
Yeah, it's a couple schools like that. Michigan is, is another. Michigan one. State, yes. Because yeah. Rodney Whitaker teaches there. Yeah, everybody. Rodney Whitaker right. and Rodney Jordan, they homies. Right. So a lot of cats from Florida State, we send, a, the, those two schools send a lot of students to each other. A lot of friends that, um, that I have either went to Florida State for undergrad and then went to Michigan State for grad school or vice versa went to Michigan State for undergrad and then came down to Florida State for grad school. So that those two schools, Michigan State and Florida State, they send a lot of students towards each other. Yeah, because whenever a base player, Greg, tell me they went to Michigan, I know I'm about to have a great night. Yes. <laughs> I'm about to have a good night tonight, yes. baby. Michigan State has some great base players, man. Rodney Whitaker, yeah. Ryan All Sauer. the cats I bet from both schools sound wonderful, man. We just had an outdoor player join the Buble band from Michigan, and he's killing, man. He sounds yeah. beautiful. Yeah, man. Joe, Joe, I want to talk about the school of Ellis Marcellus. Oh, okay. Okay. Because me and you are in that fraternity. We're in that fraternity, yes, sir. <laughs> Leon is in the fraternity. It's not a whole yeah. lot of us. Brian Blade, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of cats, you know, mm -hmm. uh, came through the school of Ellis Marcellus. Yes, man. I always tell people, and, and my wife was making fun of me for saying this, but like, I learned music on the streets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, can you, what was that like for you, uh, you know, working with him and, and learning from him? Um, man, that was, that was an amazing experience. Um, you know, for me, I remember the first couple of times I was afraid to, uh, I was afraid to talk to him and to ask him to sit in, you know, cause, cause when I, when I first moved to town, you know, you were, you had just left. So it was, you know, Stephen Gordon was playing the gig for a while. And then um, Joe Dyson was playing for the gig. And then Adonis was playing the gig. And um, I would go out and, you know, I would go out there and check him out. And um, he said, man, why don't you, you know, ask Ellis, ask, ask Ellis to sit in. I was like, nah, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Um, and then, um, you know, one day I did, you know, and, 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 and um, after the set, you know, we just started talking, you know, he's asked me where I was from. Um, and then I told him that I studied with Leon Anderson and he told me a lot about Leon. And, and so, and when I told him I was from Virginia, we, that was another common thing we shared because a lot of people don't know that Ellis taught at VCU uh, for a few years as well in Richmond, Virginia. Yep. Yep. Um, so, uh, when I told him I was from Virginia, he picked, perked up too. He's like, oh, okay, I used to teach in Richmond. Um, and so uh, our relationship will kind of build from there. Um, and then um, uh, it was getting to the point where I, I was sitting in pretty regular, you know, learning the repertoire. And then I remember one Friday um, I walked in and um, Susie, who know, he normally um, works at the ticket booth, She's like, hey, Ellis left something for you. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And it was a stack of CDs with a note on it. Um, you know, learn. He was like, check these, check these albums out. And it was a stack oh, of his God. records. He liked you more than uh, me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we got no. Uh, you you just had it. You just had it way before I did, man. I, I had to give him a condensed version. Um, he left a stack of CDs. He was like, hey, check these out. And then. Um, you know, maybe like a week later, you know, um, his, uh, who's the lady who used to do all his, um, handle his things, Lisa McCarthy, Lisa, Lisa McCarthy, who unfortunately passed away as well, um, hit me, uh, emailed me. He was like, hey, I would like to do some gigs with you. Are you interested? Yes. <laughs> you know, I couldn't respond to that one fa fast enough. So that's kind of how it started. And then when, I got in the band, that's when I learned the most important lessons because I remember being super insecure um, because I was intimidated by the people who played the gig before me. Um, so, you know, I was asking Ellis a lot of questions and, and this was, you know, this is in the later part of, this is the last few years of Ellis's life. So this is 2018, you know, to, to him passing in 2020. So at that point in, in Ellis's life, he he ain't trying to, he ain't talking a whole lot, you know? Um, so I'm asking him all these questions about Herlin Riley and Joe Dyson and 
um, Adonis and everybody, he was like, man, you got to be yourself. He was like, if I wanted Herlin Riley, I would have just called Herlin Riley. You know, if I wanted Joe Dyson, I would have just called Joe Dyson. You know, I, I wanted you to do your thing on it. I want you to interpret it how you want to interpret it. You know, I don't, I'm not looking for you to do their thing. I want you to do your own thing. And um, when he told me that, you know, that kind of gave me the license to, you know, and the security to like, okay, I can kind of do my thing. Cause I was, I was literally trying to play the gig like everybody else played it, you right. know, to try to not, not mess it up, you know, but Ellis <laughs> at that point, at that, at that point in life, man, he was just like, man, I want you to do you. We never rehearsed. Yeah. He never asked me if I knew a song. He was just like, you play it and That's you it. strap on for the ride. <laughs> man, you know, we had one rehearsal. Really? Man. I, well, it, 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 was, it was before a gig and he was like, you know, Jackie, he had this arrangement of Jackie. I'm sure y'all played it. Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we, we, that was it. And then one time he asked me, he was like, uh, the only time he ever asked me if I do a song was like, he was like, do you know two bass hit? And I was like, nah. He was like, cool. And then we played it. Play and, it and then I got pipes. And then he said, you will know it tomorrow night, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, I will. I'm in a hotel no. room. Fucking. <laughs> I, I, had a, I have a similar story. He said, not do you know, uh, what's the James Black tone? Um, whistle stop? Whistle stop. He's like, are you familiar with whistle stop? And I was like, no, I don't. I don't uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that one. He was like, "Okay, well, when you get a, uh, when you get a chance, go home and check that one out." And then he started the set with the chord, with the whistle stop chord, and looked at me and smiled. <laughs> <laughs> Delirio, boo beep, bro. Delirio, boo doo, I was like, "Oh man!" He just he, he, his head was down. He played the chord, and smiled at me. Uh, oh, okay. I guess I'm learning it now. All right. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we, we we have a shared experience like that, man. I love it. I love it. But E man, like uh, he was man, like um, he really another thing he um made me focus on was teaching melodic percussion because he would always ask me, "Hey, have you ever played the vibes? Have you ever played the timpani? Are you in symphonic band?" And I was like, yeah, I did it. I did it in undergrad, but not so much um, in grad school. I was pretty much focused on drum. He was like, okay, well, I want you to teach vibraphone at the Ellis Marsalis Center. So I actually taught vibraphone for three years at the Marsalis Center. And he, he uh, gave me that gig because he knew it would make me have to shed to go teach it. You know, I'm teaching, I'm teaching, you know, middle school age kids so it's like he got it made me have to go shed my theory and go re uh relearn a lot of stuff that i had forgotten so i could teach the other kids um and those things have helped me um you know at when it when it comes to composition and stuff like that you know and i'm still working them out too um because uh, uh one thing i want to get more into is like writing down the songs that I'm hearing in my head um, and just having the, um, you know, theoretical knowledge um, to be able to put it down on paper so I can explain it to somebody else, um, you know? And so like now that I'm, you know, summer here, I got the vibes in the other room. So, you know, I've, I've been, I've been kind of getting revisiting those things, man, and relearning tunes on the vibraphone, um, you know, cause uh, that's something that I think drummers should have a good, you know, you don't have to be, you know, you know, you don't, you don't have to have like a super deep theoretical um, knowledge base. I mean, it would be nice, but just to do the base, basic things would be cool. And Ellis wanted me to know that. So I had to teach it. So. Yeah. Hey, Greg, you hear how, how Gerald just challenged me? Cause I ain't got no vibraphone. Now I got to go buy a vibraphone. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I'm hey. looking forward to this vibraphone. <laughs> Man. <laughs> I, my goal is to eventually, man, and, and I gotta start dragging my feet. I want, man, I want to be able to get to a point where I can gig on the vibes. Hmm. I want to get to that point where I can gig on the vibes. And I'm a long way away from that, though. Hey, so, so maybe 
I have so many questions, but since we're talking about the vibes now, I think something that's really important for, again, like, I'm going to use these terms here, but I know they're not real. They don't really exist in reality, but like a, a drummer is an instrument that, you know, traditionally, or we'll, we'll say in the academia is spoken of as a percussive instrument, right? Mm -hmm. A vibraphone piano, which is like a harmonic instrument. I, mm -hmm. I know, I know everything is a drum and mm -hmm. all that kind of shit, but what, what is the value of a drummer learning a melodic instrument and a horn player learning an instrument that is like more percussive based? Okay. Um, one of the reasons where, where, one of the reasons why I could identify forms so easily is because, like I said, my mother and my father are both church organists. Um, so I can hear a progression. I can hear where the chords are going um, because I've been hearing it all my life. Even when I was at home, um, my bedroom was adjacent to our music room in our house. So my dad would spend a lot of nights just playing solo, learning songs and stuff from church. So I'm hearing him shed. And so I'm, I'm recognizing different chord progressions. Um, a lot of the same chord progressions that are used in, in gospel are also used in jazz. So I'm able to identify the form. So for a drummer, um, a lot of times I can play tunes that I don't know um, I might not know the melody, but once I hear the progression, I can identify the form and I, and I, I know where the song's going just from that. Um, I think, I think um, instrumentalists that don't play rhythm, rhythm instruments or percussion instruments to spend way more time playing um, or understanding percussive instruments because a lot of times, and, and this is this is my great, a gripe a lot with horn players uh, is depending on the drummer for the time. Time should be everybody's responsibility in the band, you know, on a, yep. on a sheet of music, um, you know, first thing you see is the key signature. Second thing is you see time signature. Everybody should be able to, I, I think, does a time signature come first? Key signature comes first before the time signature. You should ask a music educator. We'll probably have to call one in. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, right, 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 right. Uh, I think it's the key. It's the uh, the treble clef, then the time signature. The clef, the time signature, then the key signature. See, these are the questions. These are, see, this is why being a teacher is so important because you take uh -huh. so many things for granted, and then when you uh -huh. have to go and explain it to someone, you're like, wait, holy shit, what goes right. what comes first? <laughs> <laughs> but but man, yeah. I, I think everybody should have a good basis of rhythm because a lot of times, and that's why I, I really appreciate playing with great musicians who have good internal time because you don't have to babysit as much. You know, um, the way the music is going, the days of a drummer just holding down um, a beat just so everybody else can feel comfortable, those days are long and gone. You know, I, I believe that everybody should have good internal time to, to the point where um, a drummer putting a beat somewhere where you're not expecting it doesn't make you crash and burn. I'm, I want to add something to that, Greg, real quick. We all have, I'm like, I got to chime in on this too, man. <laughs> so, two, two things, one time thing and then one rhythm thing. The thing about time too, Gerald, y'all that people don't realize is time is elastic. Mm-hmm. So as soon as you free me up, like for instance, if I play with Barry Stevenson, mm -hmm. like me and Barry have a, a, a marriage of time. Mm -hmm. And so our time, like whenever somebody plays with us, they're like, ooh, y'all take a lot of risks. Mm -hmm. It's not that, it's that we trust each other. We're like, this is the time, but we're going to go over here for a minute, you know? Uh -huh. and a lot of horn players, they don't have that because they only practice with a metronome. Mm -hmm. So the shit's got to be in the middle. Uh -huh. or they, they On the feel, grid, yeah. You know, uneasy. Mm -hmm. With rhythm, uh, non-percussionists don't realize that rhythm is three or four dimensional. Mm -hmm. it, it is, so what they do is they hear a quarter note and that's it. But I'm, no I'm subdivisions. Right. No <laughs> subdivisions. If you listen to a drummer, for instance, uh, like Eric Harlan uh -huh. uh, or Jason Marcellus or Ari Holnick, mm -hmm. if you hear Eric, Eric hears every dimension there is. Uh, yep. and he's moving between them easily. Not 
as explicit as a person like Ari is. Ari's mm-hmm. doing it, but he's like, we're here, now we're here, now we're And so mm-hmm. horn players, they hear one thing, they hear the quarter note. And that shit is annoying because if you do anything else, they fucked up. And I'm just like, bro. Bruh. I'm like, come on, dog. Like, <laughs> it's like you you keeping me in the box. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not free. I, I hate that. It's just like I practice yeah. all this stuff. Like on an open like, drum solo, man, and you hear them counting through your solo, or you trying to you hear them marking the form doing your solo. I'm like, no. <laughs> just listen to my phrasing. Listen to the phrasing. Stop trying to count the bars. How do you even know I'm playing the form? I'm always like, how do you know I'm playing the form? They assume because that's all they can relate. That's all they can relate to. They need something to anchor them. You know what I do to fuck them up? I play the form the first chorus. Uh And then after that, I say, fuck your form. (laughs) That's every time I'm just looking at them like, no, bro. Okay, the form is here. Fuck that. (laughs) But but the, you know to what me, really the, grinds my gears is when drummers don't play the form, man. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the dimensions oh, of rhythm is something I I I never talk to a non drummer about it. I, I don't think they know. No, and and the ones that do, the ones that do know, those are the those are the ones that make drumming easy. You know, Savon Pendicott. You ever played? Oh, with really? Him? I never met him, but yeah. I oh, can't so kill him. A lot of, you know. I, 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 I appreciate, you know, um, that that's one thing I really appreciated about Jason Weaver. Um, he, he don't need nobody to give him nothing rhythmically because he is, is, is there, you know, and it, it was very liberating knowing that, you know, he's a bass player that, you don't got to babysit not and, and, and him amongst a lot, you know, a lot of others, but he just stood out in my mind because he's one of the first bass players I played with when I moved to town and I was used to a certain thing. Um, and then when I came here and he was so solid in his time, um, freed me up in a, in a way that I hadn't felt before. And it's like, wow, that's pretty cool that, you know, the bass player, uh, he, because he, man, he's playing all over the form, man. But, 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 but it's in there, man. And and and, and he plays in a way where you don't get lost. Um, and is and is very liberating. So yes, yes, yes. I think I think non drummers should really deal with time and rhythm in the subdivisions of the rhythm. That's a very good point, Darian. Because there's a lot of subdivisions between the quarter notes. I'll say this too, in being a teacher and having to jump through the hoops of academia for a while, harmony is easier to quantify on a piece of paper and say this is correct or this is incorrect. Mm -hmm. Rhythm is much more challenging to quantify and then go, hey, this, you know, Miss Miss Smith, whatever, like your son, daughter, got an F in this rhythm class because they Mm -hmm. did this piece of paper or whatever. So then it's like, you know, then you get, it's just, I think it's much more challenging to quantify rhythm in an academic Mm -hmm. setting. And again, I keep going back to the same thing. It's like, you can't teach what you don't know. And if you haven't been taught rhythm, you're not going to teach kids rhythm or any rhythm. And then I I got another thing, Herlin Riley, every instrument is a drum. That fucked me up when he said that to me. Mm -hmm. And that really changed my perspective on everything and then i started hearing like sonny rollins man is pl- like playing with rhythm you know sonny's probably one of the greatest rhythmic uh melodic instrument players of all time mm-hmm. um yeah. man i got one more thing oh also i love doing this with my kids what happens if you take away the pitches from your solo is your solo just all of a sudden your solo sucks so what happens when you just play your solo with the rhythms on a snare drum all right, yeah. that's all I have to say. I was, I've been, I, I really enjoyed listening to you guys talk about drums. I actually learned a lot in that last. Gerald, that's why drummers are geniuses, Gerald. We are. <laughs> we are. That's rhythm, the app, right? Drum genius. Rhythm is the ultimate communication tool. You know, before we had high speed inter- internet, before we had cell phones and emails and Zoom and all that stuff, people communicated with sounds and rhythm. There was a rhythm for a baby being born. There was a rhythm for war. There was a rhythm for uh, uh, marriage 
rituals, you know, there was rhythm for death. There was a rhythm, um, you know, for hunting and, and all for every aspect of life, there was a different beat. There was a different, there was a different sound associated with that. Um, and so drums, you know, it, 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 it's the, it's the instrument that I believe communicates and, and speaks to us the most because we, we are a drum, you know, inside on our left cavity of our chest is a drum that beats. And once that drum stops beating, we're dead. You know what I'm saying? Um, so every, every person, musician or non, you know, you know, is a living walking drum, you know, whether they choose to acknowledge that or explore that part of their life um, is up to them. But the fact remains that everybody who's living, you know, is, is, is a drum. So people are drones. I'm gonna stop you right there. All right, okay. good night. Y'all have a great night. <laughs> See y'all next week. Yo, look, Gerald been preaching since he was six years old. <laughs> <laughs> look, Gerald, man, we went up on time, but before we go, and, and uh, first of all, thank you. You killed this. Uh, no problem, man. No problem I, at all, man. <laughs> I wanna uh, give you an opportunity to tell the people where to connect with you, where they can buy your signature drums and hats and, and draws and all that stuff. Where can they find <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, so if you want, if you want to uh, connect with me, man, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Gerald T. Watkins Jr. on Facebook, um, on Instagram, G. T. Watkins Jr. Um, you can email me, uh, G. Watkins 07 um, at gmail.com. Um, those are probably the three main ways you can. Uh, kind of see what I'm up to um, and see, you know, see what I'm doing. Um, um, and if you're ever in New Orleans, you know, reach out, you know, I'm, I'm usually playing somewhere or, you know, um, out some with somebody. So uh, just, you know, find me on those three things and we can, we can go from there. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, uh, I, I thank really y'all, man. walk thank away from this so conversation much. feeling like I learned a lot and I appreciate both of y'all so much, but you know, thank y'all. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be able to share the little bit that I know. <laughs> All right, y'all go, go find Gerald on the social medias, get in his DMS, buy his records. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. Saturn quartet record, man. Yeah. Check it out. I'm really, I really, uh, All right, uh, hold up, hold up, hold up. Pop question. I just had a drummer text me. It says, yo, what should I check out? I need one record for this cat. Young high school cat. Ooh, one record? One record. I'm not, I'm not going to send him 10. He needs one. <laughs> Jazz record? Anything. Whatever, what Any is record. record? Ooh, ooh. He needs to know. One record. Like if, ooh, um... All right, to be continued. We'll see y'all next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's rough. Yo, Gerald, man, thank you so much, bro, for, for coming on the show. No man. problem. No, yeah, you got to start with that one record, man. I, yeah, right. <laughs> I, I would have to think on that, man. Yeah. But uh, no problem, man. Thank, thank you yeah. all for having me, man. All right, all right y'all. My name is Darian Douglas. I'm Gregory Ajid. Catch y'all later.